Hello everybody, I'm Ajit K. Mishra, your course instructor for literature and coping skills. I'm here again with another segment of this course and this segment is Defeating Depression. If you all remember, our last segment was on conquering fear and we discussed various aspects of fear and how to overcome fear by developing certain coping skills and coping strategies. So while talking about fear, I focused on fear and anxiety and then with the help of two very, very popular literary compositions, this Be Not Proud and The Road Not Taken, we got to understand how to manage fear by employing certain coping strategies. In this module that is on defeating depression, I am going to talk about depression. The moment I, I use that word depression, you all get to know what it is all about and how it is very, very crucial to our understanding of our well-being. So if our existence is depression free, then we can say, yes, we have a good existence and good life. But that's not the case. Depression is in the air. It's everywhere. We get to hear about it regularly. And it is also one of the most frequently searched words in the internet. So that clearly suggests how depression has turned out to be uh, one of our major problems and how it's very important for all of us to take care of depression as soon as possible. So let's start. This module, as I have already told you, is going to focus on the various skills and strategies that we need in order to defeat this demand that's called depression. So, uh, in uh, order to defeat depression, we need to be very, very clear about the kind of images that we create about depression in our minds. You can see the image on your screen. It's of a manhole, a dark manhole, the underground and the lid right over it. So, if somebody is inside the manhole and the lid is closed, imagine the condition of the person. The person will be suffocated and the person will definitely succumb to death. So, that's the kind of feelings we generally get when we come across depression or when we see people who are struggling with depression. So, they generally find themselves in a manhole. This is one of those imageries that we can create in order to understand depression better. It's the manhole until and unless you try hard to push the lid out of the manhole, out of the top and then try to move out of it. It's not going to happen. That's exactly how we need to struggle with depression so that we are, are able to overcome it. We are able to fight our way back into life. So. Uh, that's exactly how you need to push the manhole uh, so that you can try to move out of it by using a ladder. So th this imagery probably uh, suggests how we can try our best to come out of the manhole, the dark realm, and we can return to life by using a few strategies and skills. So that's uh, how I'm going to focus in this uh, segment, this material. Uh, there are four uh, lectures in this material. Each of these uh, lectures is going to focus on one important aspect of depression and the various strategies that we can employ in order to overcome this problem. So uh, I'll be doing uh, as feeling weird and losing touch twice one and two and then I'll be focusing on Break, Break, Break by Tennyson, a very famous uh, Victorian uh, poet. And then finally I'll be focusing on John Keats' uh, Ode on Melancholy uh, to talk about how uh, the various aspects of depression can be taken care of by uh, employing the proper strategies and by cultivating the right kind of skills in us. So, in this lecture, I'm going to focus on this particular aspect, that is feeling weird and losing touch, the first part. So, 
Now, this is a very, very interesting question that we generally come across. People ask us, how exactly are you feeling even when we are not recuperating uh, from an illness? We generally are asked this question by people around us, how are you feeling? Uh, so most often the response is in a variety of ways. So uh, this is in fact a core effect, a subjective experience, uh, uh, which we can uh, not only figure out, but also communicate at any point in time, because this is a neurophysiological state. And uh, I can always respond to such questions by saying, I'm feeling good or bad, I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling happy, I'm feeling dejected and rejected, excluded. There are, there are um, a variety of ways in which I can respond to this question. So if you are in, in a such uh, uh, I mean, condition, and then somebody asks you, how are you feeling? And what exactly are you going to do? Uh, you can probably say, I'm feeling sad. If you're really sad, you can say, yes, I'm feeling sad. Or if you say, I'm feeling sad, that's fine. We all feel sad. You know by now that we have certain basic emotions like sadness, happiness, anger, and a variety of other emotions like disgust, surprise, and then fear as well. So if I feel sad, there is nothing surprising about it because we all feel sad. We cannot guarantee that we will always be happy. You know that very, very well by now. So we shift or switch between the safe and the survival modes every now and then. So feeling sad is not a very, very shocking um, thing. And we generally feel sad whenever something doesn't go the way we wish or we expect, when we do not get the desired uh, result or the desired thing, we generally tend to feel sad about it. But that's not a problem. That particular type of feeling will pass, will vanish in a short time. But then if you say, I'm feeling sad, helpless, hopeless, and worthless. Now you can see the difference between the first type of expression, the first response or reaction and the second one. There's a huge difference between the first and the second reactions. In the second one, you are adding, you are saying, yes, I'm feeling helpless, I'm feeling hopeless, and I'm also feeling worthless. That means you have suddenly developed uh, a kind of a feeling that is located beyond the realm of sadness. So what exactly is that? You're hopeless and you're helpless. You cannot do anything to overcome that particular situation when you know that you are of no use or all your efforts are of no use. You cannot overcome that particular moment, situation. Therefore, you are helpless. And you're hopeless because you have probably lost all hopes that thus that situation can be surmounted. You can overcome that particular problem. And then you also feel worthless, worthless because you think you are of no use. You do not have any merit or worth. So when somebody responds in this manner or reacts in this manner, then we need to stop and think about it. Something wrong is going on inside that person's mind. That person is feeling depressed. That's an ins instance of depression. That's a sign of depression. That's not a sign of sadness only because it has extended beyond sadness. Therefore, we need to take care of this particular type of response. So, what exactly is that kind of feeling that, that we call feeling weird? That means when somebody says, I'm feeling weird, I do not know. I'm experiencing a lot of problems inside, but I don't exactly know what they are and why they are so. So that's a kind of weird feeling that we may experience at times because people do that. People experience such weird feelings uh, regularly and at times as well. So. If somebody is feeling weird, that means there's something wrong. So what's wrong? And if the response is, I just don't know what's wrong, but I know there's something wrong. 
and you cannot name it. If you remember, if you cannot name it, you cannot tame it. It becomes extremely difficult for you to comprehend that problem. So if you do not know the problem, then it will be very, very difficult for you to overcome that problem. So then, uh, and it's so because we cannot always articulate uh, our emotional state. It's very, very difficult at times. Therefore, the stress, the emphasis on articulation of our emotions is so strongly given, posited, because we all need to articulate our strong emotions. Unless we do that, we will be lost within the darker realm of those emotions, those distressing and disturbing emotions. So whether somebody is sad, scared, even happy or angry, if somebody cannot articulate those emotions, that means somebody is going to be embroiled in those emotions as well. So that's, that's important. And then uh, sometimes these uh, weird feelings pass off quickly and soon will not be disturbed by such weird feelings, such experiences. But what if these feelings do not pass off quickly and they, they decide to stay with us, they decide to become a part of our existence, what will happen? That's exactly what happens because uh, most of the times these weird feelings uh, just do not leave us. They stay with us. They, they make a house here in, in us. And when that happens, that means there is something serious. There is a problem that we need to take care of quickly. So that's exactly what we call depression because it's much more profound, devastating than just sadness. So therefore, uh, depression is something that uh, we all need to look forward to so that uh, we can understand, we can comprehend its onslaught and we can uh, devise various strategies to overcome this problem. So what exactly is a depression? We all know it uh, you know, characterizes feelings of being sad. You're sad, you're discouraged, you're hopeless, and you're irritated easily. You feel unmotivated, lack of energy. There is no excitement. There's no pleasure in doing things, in activities. And then a general and overall lack of interest or pleasure in life. Now that's very, very important because that points our attention towards the eros instinct. And when you lose that eros instinct, that means you are captured, you are seized by the thanatus instinct. And when the thanatus instinct takes over you, you lose contact with life. You don't like to exist, you don't like to live. That's exactly what happens to people when they lose interest in life, when they do not have any excitement in life. And then when these feelings, the feelings of uh, discouragement, hopelessness, um, demotivation and a variety of other feelings, if they last for a short period, that's fine because they generally come to us like the blues. So we can have our blue moments because uh, we can be sad, we can be dejected, we can be demotivated, we can be discouraged, hopeless at times. If the duration of such experiences is short enough, then there is nothing to worry about. If it's the otherwise, if it's the other way, then that's a problem. We need to think about it seriously. So if they do not leave us quickly, that means, and especially uh, if we go by the DSM manual, if they stay with us for more than two weeks, there is a cause for concern. That means that's a sign of a depressive disorder. So we, we need to be very, very cautious about it. And then uh, when we come to the other uh, aspects of depression, we all know that most people feel depressed at times. That's not a problem because uh, this, this cycle of life 
is replete with uh, a variety of uh, shocks, uh, disturbances, uh, distressful moments. So for example, uh, losing a loved one and getting fired from one's job and going through a bad or strained uh, relationship and even a divorce and then a variety of difficult situations in life. All these things can lead to a feeling of uh, sadness, loneliness, nervousness and anxiety. So this can be short-lived depression. But then if these feelings, if we are able to overcome these challenges like, you know, taking care of a strained relationship, either by getting a divorce or by making it good, repairing it, and then setting things right. And then when we overcome the loss of a loved one by returning to life and activities, then we can overcome these problems. But what if a person is unable to overcome these problems soon? That will lead to uh, serious issues. So that way, uh, we all can say depression is more than just sadness. Because once it sets in, once it becomes a part of our existence, it begins to interfere with our daily activities. How we eat, how we sleep, how we behave, how we uh, view things, how we understand things. So just everything it begins to interfere with all these activities of our life. Then there's a problem. That becomes a serious one. And then finally, uh, this one is uh, from the WHO. The earlier ones is from the American Depression and Anxiety Association. So that's... Uh, so these problems can become chronic and recurrent and lead to substantial impairments in an individual's ability to take care of his or her everyday responsibilities. At its worst, depression can lead to suicide. And that's, that's a reality. So that's why WHO calls it one of the biggest health burdens, health hazards of our times. So if we do not take care of depression, it's going to you know, take care of us. And that will be or cause of concern. So there are a, a you know, variety of uh, uh, types or various types of depression. I'm not going to deal with each one of them in detail. I'm just going to uh, give a hint at each one of them and the most major ones so that we gather some information about how depression is going to um, destroy or devastate our well-being. So we can start with major depression, very popularly called MDD, major depressive disorder. So these are some of uh, the uh, aspects or features of this form of uh, depression. This is one of the most serious forms of depression uh, because uh, it interferes uh, with one's ability to work, study, eat and sleep. That means it's going to disturb us in multiple ways. It's going to devastate us in multiple ways. So therefore, it's the most serious of all depression types. So uh, it can also take spontaneously uh, during or after the death of a loved one, a romantic breakup, a medical illness or any other life event that is shocking, that's, that's disturbing. Uh, for us. And then some people with major depression may feel that life is not worth living. And that's a very, very serious condition because that's exactly where people uh, decide to drop the gauntlet and recede into darkness that we call death by committing suicide or putting an end to their lives, which according to them is not worth living. So, we come to a subtype of uh, major depressive disorder uh, that is melancholia. Uh, I'm going to talk about melancholia in the third lecture of this uh, material uh, when uh, we, we focus on 
uh, the various aspects of melancholy. Uh, especially when uh, I, I talk about John Kitt's uh, Ode on Melancholy, uh, the fourth lecture of this module. So therefore, I'm going to focus on melancholia in detail. So then we come to the second uh, most important type of uh, uh, depressive disorder, that's persistent depressive disorder, which is otherwise called dysthymia. Uh, yeah, this type of depression can be established when it usually sets for at least two years. That means that somebody continues to uh, be within the grip of this particular type of uh, distress for two years. And then you can say, yeah, somebody is uh, uh, experiencing persistent depressive disorder. Um, it's less severe in comparison to the earlier one, that's major depressive disorder. And then uh, it can also, like the previous one, show up stress, irritability, and mild anhedonia. That's mild, unlike uh, the previous one, in which uh, it's severe hedonia. That means you'll not derive any pleasure from life's activities or life itself. So that will stop for you. So therefore, it's important that we understand. Then we come to another very severe kind of uh, uh, depressive disorder, that's bipolar disorder. So most of us are familiar with this kind of depressive disorder in which there is uh, a severe mood swing. A person who is experiencing this type of disorder experiences uh, extreme high and extreme low moods starting with a manic uh, disorder to the depressive disorder. That means uh, when somebody is experiencing manic uh, disorder, uh, somebody you know, feels a lot of energy, uh, irritability even. Uh, it can be happiness, it can be cheerfulness, or even anger. And somebody is uh, unnaturally excited. On the other hand, when we switch to the uh, depressive state, uh, somebody is not at all excited, somebody shows as if he or she has no energy and there is no intention to engage with life's activities. So, so it swings between mania and depression and in between oh, we can also experience hypomania, so mild highs, so from highs to mild highs to extreme or severe lows. So that's, that's how it uh, visits us. And then uh, it also causes severe changes in uh, people's behavior who experience this kind of depressive disorder. So mood changes and impulsive behavior are very, very frequently reported things in this kind of depressive disorder. Now to the causes of depression. We all know there are various causes of depression. So it can be a combination of genetic, hereditary, biological, environmental, and psychological factors, or any one of them as well. For example, um, many researchers have found that those people who experience depression uh, frequently, or chronic depression, they have a smaller hippocampus, the organ that's, uh, that's responsible for uh, memory and emotion. So hippocampus, uh, smaller hippocampus, that means the hippocampus shrinks. Uh, there's still some debate over whether depression actually causes the hippocampus to shrink or the, the shrunken hippocampus, the smaller hippocampus in people turns out to be a reason for depression. People are still debating that but in any case, uh, people who do not experience any kind of depression have a larger hippocampus compared to those who experience depressive disorders. That means uh, people are unable to you know, uh, process their emotions properly or regulate their emotions properly. If you remember, I talked about the importance of emotional regulation for each one of us. So, uh, trauma can also be a cause of uh, uh, depression. 
alongside uh, loss of a loved one, difficult relationships and stressful situations. They can uh, trigger depressive episodes or uh, situational depression as well. But then if they stay with us, they do not leave us. That means they have become a part of our existence and they will continue to disturb us for a prolonged period of time. And then this is a very, very important aspect, lack of immodiversity. Uh, that means uh, if we are not awake to the challenges of disturbing emotions, for example, uh, we live in a culture that tells us that uh, sadness is uh, a bad emotion to experience. So we generally do our best to stay away from sadness. But sadness is not a bad uh, uh, emotion. We all uh, know that by now because it, it teaches us a lot of things. It prepares us for greater and bigger challenges in life. So, more diversity, that means emotional diversity is very, very important. That means if somebody uh, knows how to regulate happiness, the person should also know how to regulate sadness, how to manage sadness, anger, fear, these disturbing emotions as well. So, since we live in a culture that uh, discourages uh, emotional diversity, uh, most of us find it very, very difficult the moment we come across disturbing emotions. So, we, we begin to um, crumble, we, we begin to fragmentize. So that's a problem. So you can watch this uh, Pixar uh, movie Inside Out. It's an animated movie. Um, that's a wonderful experiment uh, um, because it moves uh, all the viewers, uh, young and old, to take a look inside our own minds, something that we generally do not know or do not do. So therefore, you can try this movie uh, because it tells us how to cope with a variety of emotions, how to regulate a variety of emotions. So, emotional diversity can be a major cause of depression because we don't know how to handle sadness. We allow it to settle down, stay with us because we do not know how to overcome it. Just imagine if somebody knows how to overcome sadness after a certain period of time, the person can never ever experience depressive states. Since most of us do not know how to overcome or take care of sadness, we uh, generally you know, uh, feel trapped within the depressive states. So, there are a few warning signs of depression that we all need to be awake uh, to. Uh, for example, this can be, uh, I have no reason to live. That means you have suddenly lost all interest in life, all excitement about life, and you don't have even a single reason to live or continue to live. If this is a statement, that's a warning sign of depression because that tells you that you have a very low self-esteem or self-worth. So I'm being a burden uh, to others. Uh, that means you do not see yourself as a valuable entity or your existence as of some use to people around you and you begin to treat yourself as a burden. So you can see the kind of images that uh, these statements uh, create when they present the views over depression. So burden and then risen and then finally I'm feeling trapped. So you feel as if you're trapped either inside the manhole, you remember that manhole image I showed you all at the beginning of this lecture. Inside that manhole, inside a dark room, inside a dark alley, so it can be anything. So if somebody begins to feel trapped that means somebody is unable to move out of it, then you know that's a warning signal because that person doesn't know what to do about it. So all these are the warning signals or warning signs of depression and we need to 
be aware of these warning signs so that we can extend some help to people around us. And then we come to uh, the most important thing, that is coping with depression. No one of us will certainly like not to cope with depression and uh, will allow depression to set in, will allow depression to devastate and destroy us. That is something that probably none of us would like to be or not like to have. So we have to cope with depression. There are a variety of ways. I have listed a few so that you get an idea of how to cope with depression. Staying in touch because the moment a depression sets in, people begin to withdraw. Withdraw from people around us and then they begin to withdraw from themselves. For example, I am feeling trapped. I have no reason to live. I have become a burden on others. You begin to withdraw from others and yourself as well. That is not going to help. So staying in touch is definitely going to help a lot. So the moment somebody begins to withdraw from life, it's going to be fatal. So the answer is socializing. So we know how to socialize. But the problem is during depressive states, people forget how to socialize. They think that it's not worth socializing. Therefore, they do not socialize. But keeping in touch with friends and family members means that you can find someone to talk to when you're feeling low. So that's going to help us overcome those uh, attacks of depression. And then this is one of the most important things. I have already talked about it uh, while discussing death be not proud that there is no way we can escape our fears. The best way to escape our fears is to overcome them, is to conquer them. So that's the reason why I talked about conquering fear. That's the best way to overcome your fears, handle your fears, know how to manage your fears. So it's a good idea to face your fears so that you do not become habitual to avoidant behavior or avoidant strategies. That's also a strategy. That's also coping uh, strategy or skill, but it's a very bad coping skill, avoidance. So every time we are faced with some kind of challenge or difficulty, if we begin to avoid, that means we are pushing ourselves down the spiral, the dark spiral, or we are pushing ourselves into the manhole, the dark manhole. So that's not going to help. And then uh, we come to this particular important uh, strategy that is of taking a different view uh, because we all know that uh, there is something called psychological myopia, uh, short-sightedness. Uh, that means uh, we allow our mind to be fixed on one particular thing. In this case, a negative thought cycle which becomes a vicious cycle. For example, if I continue to say that I'm worthless, I'm worthless, I'm worthless, I will turn out to be worthless because I have fixed my focus on that particular thing, which is a negative thing. I need to switch my focus from the negative to the positive. So if you remember, I also talked about, uh, I think I can, I think I can. So that's the power of positive thinking. So we need to shift uh, the focus from uh, the negative to the positive so that we do not get stuck. So allowing ourselves to get stuck in negative thoughts will definitely destroy or devastate us. And then we come to a very interesting thing that's uh, visualizing a happy memory. I have already talked about how visualization can uh, empower us can help us overcome a lot of problems in life. And that's the reason why these poetic compositions do offer a tremendous amount of help when it comes to overcome the challenges of life through visualization. They help us visualize things along with the characters in those compositions. 
So when we begin to visualize, we can overcome emotional cat catatonia. So emotional catatonia is, is of course a big problem. It's a kind of numbness um, when you, you do not know what kind of emotion you're experiencing and the type of uh, uh, emotion that uh, you need to regulate. So you become totally numb to your emotional um, you know, stimuli. So you develop emotional catatonia. And then uh, if you can overcome emotional catatonia, you can encounter the gloom with a dose of positivity. So then we come to the idea of reconfiguring one's self-image. So once you begin to reconfigure your self-image, for example, I'm worthless, I'm hopeless, I'm helpless. You have created a negative self-image for yourself. The moment you begin to reconfigure that, you can look at the other possibilities. You begin to talk about yourself, especially you know, when you are visualizing a happy memory. If you can uh, recall a happy memory when you did something well, when you were rewarded, when you achieved, you felt proud, great, those memories can help you sustain yourself. Similarly, those memories can also help you reconfigure your self-image. If somebody has created a negative self-image for himself or herself, the same person can think of the other possible images for the same person. And that's going to help you reconfigure your self-image. In depression, most people begin to master self-hatred. And they also begin to master a comfortable discomfort. So they, they generally tend to show a comfortable approach with the discomfort. That's depression. So they become friends with depression. It's all about uh, uh, whom you're making friends with or who you're making friends with. So if you make friends with a negative self-image, discomfort, self hatred that means you're, you're going to be in that company forever. And that company is going to destroy you because there is no exit door. If you have to exit, you need to create that exit door. You have to create that exit door by reconfiguring the self-image. So what you can do, you can think of coping with these kinds of depression through these strategies. If that doesn't happen, then the hand that was there out of the, the dark hole, the manhole, will promptly sink inside. And there'll be no help because people will not be able to you know, discover us. And they will not heed our call for help. So therefore, it's very important that we understand these aspects of depression and we begin to take care of depression in a much more focused manner. So that's how we come to the end of this lecture on depression. And these are the sources from where I have borrowed uh, most of the ideas used in this lecture. In the next lecture, I'm going to talk about uh, the other aspects of depression. So thank you very much for joining me.